This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Kuhn-Samanuk, and I'm a program facilitator with the Regina District Industry Education Council and Chinook School Division. I'd like to welcome you here today for our spotlight on a career as an author, artist, children's programmer, and librarian. Does your imagination lead you into the world of poetry, stories, arts, and crafts? Do you like to entertain others? Known as an artist, author, puppeteer, and social media addict, Tequila's career spotlight is certain to inspire you and leave you with a number of career paths to intrigue your creative side. Before we begin our spotlight today, I'd like to remind students to take a moment following the presentation to complete the brief student survey and be entered into a draw for $50. Your feedback is important in helping us to arrange future spotlights. We will also have some time at the end of the presentation today for you to ask any questions or you may contact te Tequila directly. Tequila was raised in Maple Creek and moved to Swift Current in 2005, where she became a Prairie Quill Writers Group member. Her first picture book, Bothers, Powers of the Arch Archangel Michael, was published in May of 2014 by Balboa Press. The first short stories were published in REAL, Canadian Kids Magazine. Tequila continues to work on wordsmithing and crafting entertaining stories. Her heart is at the center of literacy. In her spare moments of her life, she practices being a social media guru, assisting self-publishing authors at, while formatting and cover design of their books and building websites. Take it away, Tequila. We're pleased to have you here today. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so I'm going to start first with um, the career spotlight on uh, my career with the Chinook Regional Library as children's programmer. And I have been with the Chinook Regional Library for almost a decade, which seems like a very long time. And I have immensely enjoyed the uh, career. I started in 2006 as a page, which uh, is an old English term for kind of like an errand person. And so what I did was I shelved books and I assisted library assistants and um, worked my way up to a library assistant. And then in 2012, I got the job as children's programmer. Um, being a children's program is a very busy job. Uh, to our 31 branches, uh, especially in the summertime. And I promote the TD Summer Reading Club. So I have a picture of the white puppet called Freddy the Yeti. He took me about eight hours to actually sew and make him. And he was well worth it. The kids love Freddy the Yeti. And then on the right side, I have a Minecraft puppet as I've done some Minecraft shows as well. And the kids love seeing the puppet shows and it gets them very excited about literacy. This is um, some giant games that we had at the Maple Creek Summer Reading Club. So children enjoyed various games like snakes and ladders and chess and different um, outdoor games for the summer. Uh, this is a story trail and we had permission to do story trails and set them up in the parks at um, the Swift Current uh, Park in two different places and people were able to like read the story and kind of follow along and work with um, us in that way. So here I am getting ready for a Hazlet program as I love coming up with fun crafts. So this is a Mardi Gras hat as we were doing a cultural day event. And this was back in my um, office at the Swift Current branch where I was working. This is a former coworker Rose from uh, Swift Current and we were setting up maker space as well at the library. So Rose and I worked um, a lot together in the time that she was with us and uh, we really liked her. So this is the cat in a hat uh, costume that I was actually originally making for myself. And one year Rose and I was doing a bunch of Halloween programs out in our uh, Southeast branches. And uh, she was doing the makerspace part with um, making slime. So it was kind of a sciencey project that fit into the school curriculum. And she was also 
um, doing Sephiros and I was doing a story time puppet show type thing and then got to help her after. And so one of my things that I feel we should do with working with uh, children, especially young children, is we need to dress up and kind of, you know, be the fun little characters that they're expecting us to be when we come and do some of the programs. So that's part of the job that I really love. So my director actually ended up wearing my cat in a hat costume. <laughs> So she was a cat in a hat whenever she came with us. And of course, I had various other costumes that I got to wear. And Rose was Mary Poppins and Anna Green Gables that year. And then here I am as Minnie Mouse doing my Halloween story time. And there's a puppet show. Then I outgrew my space at the Swift Current Branch and was moved to the Chinook Regional Library headquarters. And so this is my space now, and um, I quite enjoy it, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, I will continue being there probably until I retire. <laughs> this is uh, my director and I. We had gotten a lot of books to give away for programs. We are always looking for uh, free books to encourage uh, families and children to read. And so we're they're opening them up and organizing them so that we can give them away. This is our annual Swift Current Branches gingerbread program that we usually do it in December. And so we have a gingerbread puppet show and the kids get to decorate gingerbread cookies and kind of do a craft as well. Um, as a children's programmer, I organize uh, many of our programs, um, especially cultural programs, literacy programs, um, the summer reading club, different things to do, sometimes do with maker space. I help the 31 branches come up with ideas and programs as well, because of course I can't always go to everyone as there are 31 branches in our region. And then when I have a few minutes, I'm also writing grants so that I can get uh, funding for literacy programs, as well as cultural programs, such as uh, the Métis program that we had back in March. And uh, I was also helping to update our website and things like that. So sometimes I'll be popping into Canva to make a poster or banner or that sort of thing and getting it up on the website. So my job can be really, really busy. This is a set of earrings that I beaded as part of our beading program that I had taught in March. And they turned out well. They are traditional flower uh, pattern, which is traditional for the Métis people, which is uh, my background and culture as I am Métis. So it was lots of fun teaching people how to bead. And uh, I look forward to teaching more. Um, the little green bag on the left, or maybe it's right, it is a Swift Current participant's work. Um, I had taught a beating workshop on May 9th at Swift Current and then drove to Maple Creek and taught it again in the afternoon. And so it was in two parts. The first part, you learned about the beating and the background of it. And then the second part was you brought your pieces, they were pouch pieces, and we stitched together the pouch to make the completed project. So the one on the other side, the Maple Creek one was actually done by a 10 year old girl that had participated in the beading workshop that weekend. So this is a plasticine picture of our literacy program that we started in uh, 20, 21, uh, just the tail end of COVID, and we call it our Mo Literacy Program. Mo is named after the Elastomosaurus found at Pontex, which is a type of plesiosaurus. And so I got to create Mo at my director's request, and it is actually on an armature, a wire armature, and it is made out of five pounds of plasticine. Um, and then what I do is I get to take pictures of him dressed up in different costumes and that sort of thing. And then I use a plasticine background and use uh, green screen technology to edit the uh, model into the plasticine background. So I have drummer Mo and then police officer Mama Mo brushing baby Mo's teeth. 
here I am giving a speech for the reconciliation, which I was really proud of this year in being able to be asked to talk about the Métis and to uh, talk about the path moving forward. Um, so I was able to uh, share bits and pieces of my culture, which again also works into my library work because I am part of a lot of committees in the community uh, to do with reconciliation, um, Treaty 4, uh, to do with the Southwest Literacy Committee and all of those wonderful partners that we have in the city of Swift Current as part of uh, the Chinook Regional Library in uh, supporting all the work that our wonderful partners are doing. So here I am, uh, Wednesday night, I was honored by a special award for all my work with the library, as well as um, the work that I do with the uh, Métis Nation, Western Region 3 and Local 35, and with my claymation stuff. And I have my very first writing mentor, Brenda Niskala, with me. Um, she's been inspirational on, in my career with working both with the library as well as in writing. So I, I was very happy to share that moment with her. And then here we are as I've received my award with uh, the director and the uh, rural branch manager who is on my other side and my friend Brenda. So they were all very proud of me. <laughs> And I also got to meet the Lieutenant Governor, Governor, pardon me, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, His Honor Russ Moraski, for a second time that night. And uh, I like the fact that he said, it's nice to see you again today. Okay, so this part here is my vision for my path moving forward, and I'm hoping to accomplish this. Um, the logo was drawn by my friend Morgie, and I have permission to use it. So it is Tequila Friday Studios. And you'll notice that tequila under the red X is spelled differently <laughs> because that's how my name is pronounced and often people misspell it. And the character she drew for me is actually my puppet Thomas who um, is almost, I think, 13 years old now. And we, do, we did a lot of um, Thomas and Amani puppet shows, which eventually, because I have copyright for them, want to turn into a series. So here I am as the artist. So these are two pieces that I had on display at the West Wing Gallery last year. And um, I had... Uh, kind of have been looking at the history of kind of like the bathroom. Don't ask me why I'm interested in stuff like that. It just history and how people think about things or come up with stuff fascinate me. And so I have my little caveman here who's doing the squat and he's got some moss and a pine cone. And then I've got the modern bathroom. If I could design a bathroom, I think my bathroom would look like this is you know, sort of the mermaid bathroom. And I use some um, different materials in here to where I was experimenting with um, household materials. So the tiles are actually baking soda clay. And I found a recipe for it online and I made it with like boxes of baking soda and glue and water. And then I cut all the pieces out and they dry really hard, which is really neat. And then I used, um, hot glue to make the tiles on the bathroom floor. And then the toilet was actually uh, polymer clay. And then I built this little stand. And then my person has her phone duct taped to her hands because we seem to take our phones everywhere with us. These are a couple of my Métis characters. I am in process of having an art show out in Shonovan in a couple of weeks. Um, this has been a three-year project that I have been working on. I received a grant from Sask Arts to do uh, 24 new pieces. And so these are some of my pieces. And like Moa, I was talking about taking uh, sort of like a model of um, a doll or something like that. And then when it's created, I can project it onto a plasticine background. So this is one of my, 
my pictures that I created that way. And the reason why I do that is because I'm not really good at um, turning my characters like some illustrators are. They have that talent where they can draw a character that's face on and then a quarter view and then a side view and it looks like the same character. I have tried so hard and taken so many lessons on doing that and I cannot turn my character. So with the advancements in technology, um, I was able to create my characters this way and then I can turn them any which direction I want and it still looks like the same character. Um, these are a couple of jiggers on the shore of Lake Pelche and I see I spelled that wrong. Um, this, of course, is just 30 minutes outside of Swift Current and this piece came from like the plasticine background came from a picture I had taken uh, in order to um, sit down with it and kind of create this landscape. So this is kind of the lake and the reflection. Uh, I found out through historical research that Lake Pelche was named after Norbert Pelche, who was the first Métis who had land script there, which is why that place is is so special. And of course, lots of Métis traveled through there. This is my great grandfather, William Damien Dumont on his homestead at Fort Walsh. So this is how I sometimes will take a picture like this and then I will do a background piece from it. So this is the background behind my, my great grandfather. And this is all done with plasticine. And then this is uh, one of my little models of the lynx. And I projected him into that scene there. This is my Minecraft crew. I am working on a middle grade uh, fiction piece. Of course, many of you have probably already read and seen Minecraft novels. This is an unofficial Minecraft book, and it goes under the guidelines of Mojang to where you can write fan fiction, etc. cetera, um, as long as you create your own characters and don't take any of the artwork or the gaming designs, that sort of thing uh, from the game. So these are my characters that I had built. And this is some of the uh, work that I have done with them. And so this is in the chapter they're doing target practice. And then this is one main character and he's meeting the other main character who has like popped out of his TV as he's playing his game. And he's very surprised and I'm sure I would be too if one of my characters came popping out of my screen. So this is um, actually, I created this background to use in our Mo newsletter with the library. And uh, Mo, the uh, Elastomosaurus is looking up at the hummingbird. Um, one of the things with plasticine is you can get very textured and detailed, which is why I really like using it. And then this is a little kitty that I had taken pictures of that was in kind of like a little um, corner library that's down at our post office in web. And uh, he was looking at the books. So here I am as a writer. Um, the book I am holding in the picture, I actually designed the cover of it. And we uh, can get um, images from different places that are royalty free that you can use for publishing. And so the last anthology that the Prairie Quills Writers Group wrote, which I am part of, is called Change is Not a Four Letter Word. And so all the stories and poems in there is about change and how sometimes it's difficult and that sort of thing. Um, I'm dressed up as a fantasy creature in this picture um, that came from one of my stories that I had written and published in this book. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I had published a picture book called Bothers in 2014. And uh, Real Canadian Kids Magazine, of course, had published two of my stories before uh, they folded, which was too bad because they were an excellent uh, children's magazine. Uh, the story here is Caden and the Dragon, and it's about uh, a little boy who can't sleep and he imagines a dragon, and the dragon actually appears and takes him on a, on a journey until he falls asleep. Excuse me.
So here I am. I got to perform a puppet show for the medieval night at the Lutheran Church. And that was a lot of fun giving back to the community. And it also used my acting education. When I first graduated from high school, I actually went to Vancouver for nine months and I took acting in film and television and uh, stage and puppetry. And that was a lot of fun, but uh, I was disappointed that I couldn't get into film right away and had to come back to Saskatchewan. <laughs> but uh, it's okay because I'm using all of my talents with the library and in the community and uh, doing a whole bunch of other things that I probably never would have done had I stayed in Vancouver. And I have some poetry to read as part of being an author. Um, I write poetry, I write middle grade novels. I'm working on revising a young adult novel. Um, it had interest from a publisher, but it needed rewriting according to their advice. And so I've been slowly uh, rewriting and workshopping that because writing sometimes takes a long time before you can get it to the stage of where it's like professional enough to be taken on by a publisher. Um, lots of people uh, choose to self-publish for various reasons, even some of our more famous authors like uh, Callie Armstrong, because you can make uh, better money by self-publishing, but I'd like to be published by a traditional publisher first, and then maybe look at self-publishing self -publishing some of my stuff. So this is called Apricot Syrup. And it is from a series of poems that I'm working on called An Affair with the Sky. Apricot syrup drizzled on the horizon like grandma's jam on bannock, sweet and hot with raisins, golden honey spreading up, cutting dark gray clouds, reminds me of my great aunt from across the border smuggling cases of Roger's syrup in her motor home back across the line. Cornbread yellow webs through a choke cherry aura, tantalizing my olfacultary nerve to recall an experiment of bacon grease and cornmeal baked in a cast iron skillet in the oven. Eye of the moon like curious children with faces close to the steaming glass, smothered in butter and eaten with each family meal. A building looms in my camera's line, a reminder of how cold this world can be, yet the warmth of a few friends like a zillion drops of sunlight casting away dark clouds. And then this one is called Sky Impaled, which is also part of my um, series. And I'm just gonna move the screen out of the way. <clears throat> my heart shredded like hail plummeting from the sky, slicing through tender new leaves. My soul torn, lightning snakes through the cloth, lighting up the aches and pain it echoes, like thunder rumbling overhead, a sob escapes. The scream of an eagle after its prey, strength ebbs through the gray grief, threading its way to rebirth as the morning sun peers over the horizon. A flaming red eye searing my broken faith back together, leaving proud flesh puckered and gnarled, like the knots of a tree fighting the weather. Every sway, ever swaying, but never bending to the winds of the wind, strong against the assaults of hail and the turrets of water that threaten to wash its roots away. The tree digs in deep into the earth anchoring itself to the core as I must do. I will hold myself up, straighten my spine, 
and keep dancing to the drum of my own song. As light spears the sky, so its cheeriness impales me, and I will sing my melody. And then this one is one that I wrote. Um, it doesn't belong anywhere yet, but I thought I was thinking one day with how busy my mind sometimes can be and how creative it gets with all the many projects that I do, including at times ghostwriting for other authors. So sometimes I'll write um, their children's book for them and then they get to take the credit. So this one is called Inside My Brain. Cobwebs, combat, bright cartoon colors, abstracts, wrestle with realism, memories cherished, clashing with the present moment. Dreams whispering through neural pathways, nightmares locked in vaults like a stack of safety deposit boxes, inspiration bottled in veins, Pathways to other galaxies threaten to explode into re reality. Itching neurons escaping through cracks. Painting full moving pictures of other characters, scenes, and drama. Emotions flame and bubble like beakers held over a Bunsen burner. Then darkness descends, the curtain closes. Oops. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, a little bit about more about uh, education. If you do choose a career in, say, libraries, I do recommend um, having a master's in library of science and how you get that is you do a bachelor's of anything. So it could be a bachelor's in art. It could be a bachelor's in English or a bachelor's in engineering, if you like, and then uh, another few years to get your master's. Uh, that really opens up other opportunities for you to work in different libraries and different settings and to access other um, departments such as management and all those sorts of things, if that is what you would like. Um, for myself, I really have chosen more of the creative career because I've always wanted to be more of a writer from the time I was eight. And so that's why I did my acting class. And then later in my 20s, um, I did uh, my education assistant, but I kind of uh, wasn't the right fit for me as a job. Um, so then when I moved to Swift Current, I took um, some online courses through the Institute of Children's Literature, and I earned uh, three diplomas over the years in writing for children and teens, which is where I really like to be. And during that time, I had started working with the library, which was like, yes, this is where I want to be. This is my job. So I was quite grateful to have all of that come together. And I do use all of my skills um, as a writer and artist, um, as a performer and actor, and all of that with my library job as well. So it's pretty much as part of me as um, eating and sleeping is. Thanks, Tequila. Um, I have a few questions for you. Um, first sure. of all, I think, I think it's really interesting to see how your career path has evolved. And, you know, you had a passion as a child uh, uh, for for writing and, and acting and, and the arts and how that's evolved. And over the course of a number of years, you were able to create this dream job that really isn't a particular career that exists. You just m melded a few different kinds of things together. So that's interesting to see. Um, how did you know, though, that you you might be interested in working with young children or working at the library? Um, working with young children has always been something that I had done since I was a teenager. I used to take the bus all the time to Swift Current for orthodontic appointments. And my grade six French teacher 
um, I had kept in contact with her. So I'd always call her in order to have like a contact in Swift Current because I was all by myself coming up to these appointments. And so she would have me come to work with her and I would actually work in her classes with the kids in supporting them in reading and stuff like that. And they were uh, grade ones. And then eventually she switched to like twos, threes and um, that sort of thing. And so it was great experience that way because it's like, you know, I like doing this and I like supporting the kids with what they are learning. And I could relate to some of them too, like when they were struggling with reading, because um, for myself with my own education, uh, if you don't have good support in the classroom sometimes, and you don't have good support at home from the parents, then it's very difficult to learn early literacy skills or reading. And so I actually struggled with reading up until about grade three. And then that's when they were able to get me a, an EA to work with me in order to strengthen my reading skills and material. I was actually interested in reading because I always say I hated that story about Gus and his nut. <laughs> and, and it was like, you know, I wanted to read about robots and, and witches yeah. and that sort of thing. I, I was a more of a fantasy type of person because that was uh, how I entertained myself at home was ima- with, with my imagination. And so that was why. So it was like, I knew I wanted to work with young children, but I didn't know how or what I wanted to do. And so I was thinking more of like getting into children's um, television, like Mr. Dress Up, because I was that type of personality. Um, I liked working with puppets and making things. Um, I'd also done a lot of babysitting. And so kept the kids really engaged and entertained. It was pretty much... um, for some of the families they are like, okay, who do you want to babysit you? And they'd name me. So, <laughs> which is always good. It's interesting to hear you say that um, you had a passion for children. And so you weren't really sure how you were going to fulfill that passion to work with children. So you tried on a variety of different things till you found something that fit, yeah. which is good for kids to know that, you know, you don't always know what you want to do in the end. You, you create that and trying on something and, figuring out that that's not the right fit is okay. And then you just move on to the next thing until you find what fits for you. Uh, it's also yeah. interesting to hear you say, and I had, I had a question later on, I was going to ask around um, writing and stuff, because, you know, some people are afraid that they can't write. And, and for you to, to, to share that, you know, reading was something that was very difficult for you at the beginning. And then you learned how to read and, and you can tear, continue with this passion for writing. It's inspiring for kids to see that, you know, um, things change and what you may not be good at something to begin with that can change. You can, and you can grow and develop that. So I'm, I'm excited that you shared that with us for kids to see that everything is possible. Um, it is possible. And I also like my grade two teacher used to use my spelling list because I could write the words by looking at them and by hearing them, even though I couldn't really understand what they meant. And so I'd draw a lot of pictures and I'd write stories that way. And she always encouraged that in hopes that I would develop more um, kind of uh, the skills in reading. But it was just, yeah, it was a challenge. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and yet you're here to see yeah. where you've come. And now you're an author. That's, yeah, that's kind I know. of interesting yeah. to see. I would have never dreamed that you would have that kind of job. Um, for students out there who... Um, uh, might be interested in working with children um, mm-hmm. or, or working at a library, what kind of experiences do you think they should start to have for themselves so that they can sort that out? Um, if they are interested in working at the library, often we will have um, positions open for students. So things like a page position, which is, like I said, that's where I started. And so you would need to know your what we call the Dewey Decimo system. So that's the filing of nonfiction books. And then know the fiction books, which is filed by last or last name of the author. And we do some training along those lines for pages in order to help. Uh, for me, one of the things that I did in high school was I actually helped my high school librarian uh, shelve her books. And so she taught me at times 
on the different systems and how things go. And then I would go and help her because often she was quite busy during the day and she'd have miles and miles of books on carts that weren't put away. And so I'd go in and help put them away for her. So there are opportunities in the school to even help your librarian. Um, that would be really good. Uh, being a school librarian is slightly different from a public librarian, but there's a similar system with both how you put books on shelves and that sort of thing. Um, with the public library, the pages do assist the library assistants or the librarian. And um, so they will do things like the pages might cut out the crafts that are being prepared for the program, or they might um, have to assist with a program that a library assistant is doing. They may even have to help with a puppet show or if they're brave enough to sing some songs, they might sing some songs and rhymes. So that sort of thing. And then there's a variety of those things that help. Um, some of them will do what we call the mail. So once the library assistant does the pull list, so that's a list of things with um, all the books that are going out to other branches. And then they have to pack them in the boxes according to the different branches that they're going to. Oh, so there okay. is that. Um, there's opportunities sometimes for volunteers. And so if there's a volunteer opportunity, definitely take that part of it. Um, there is, yeah, different, different ways of getting in. And then well, to, see that, that right, like as a librarian, you're not just filing books and reading all the time. Like you can be, you never read all the time. You, you, you only get to read the books you're going to do in your programs. Oh, that wow. that is, is such a myth. I, I kind of always roll my eyes when a patron comes in and says, but aren't you sitting around and reading? It's like, we, we don't have time <laughs> to do that. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're uh, serving patrons and, um, and uh, doing actual work, answering phones, ordering books. Um, yeah, like there's a wide variety of, of things that people do. So. so, I mean, I can tell by your passion that it's a very rewarding job. It um, is. But what kind of challenges do you experience? Because students want to know that as well. And they also want to know about the financial gain. Is there a financial <laughs> gain? Or do you multitask and do other things? Um. Okay, so I can start with the financial part. Now, this is always a joke among librarians. They say, if you want to make big button, big bucks, big money, don't become a librarian, be a lawyer or a politician or a doctor. <laughs> uh, for me, it, this job was just the right fit. And I do other um, sideline things in order to help supplement the income because we are uh, under the government of education and like schools, we get cutbacks and all of those things because we are dependent upon, um, the government to provide funding so that we can keep our services free. And it's in the library legislation to keep all of our programs and our services free so that, uh, people have access to them and mm -hmm. that they're not an extra expense that, maybe someone can't really afford or that sort of thing. Um, an example of that is when the um, transit system shut down, the Greyhound transit system shut down in Saskatchewan, there was no place that offered free resume writing. And when you're unemployed and don't have a job, you don't have money to have somebody write your resume. And so they came to the library for that service. Mm -hmm. um there's lots of parents who are on a very tight budget and so they're looking for activities for their children to do and they may not always have the support or the finances that they need to put them into things like dance or gymnastics and so the library offers a lot of free programming that mm -hmm. parents can access which isn't um out of their budget so that's kind of some of where we operate and we are considered like a nonprofit because we don't make money on any of our services that we do mm -hmm. with the exception of asking um, for fees for books that have been destroyed. <laughs> uh, more of kind of like a replacement cost if a book has been damaged. Mm -hmm. So, so that is that part, but overall I feel um, that I get paid fairly well. And it's one of those things that it's not 
a minimum wage job, but it's more kind of lower end middle wage, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, which is why if you have a master's in library of science, you can actually move around into management in which you get paid higher and that sort of thing. But I'm also not a manager. I, I don't like managing people. <laughs> uh, kids are my thing. So it yeah. depends on what you want to do. And there are different types of library jobs. Like uh, there's a colleague of mine that's working for the RCMP and keeping the RCMP library in Regina. And then there's um, another one that has gone to Chilliwack to keep the archival library alive. And so there's different salary ranges in there as well that um, are more profitable for some people than mm -hmm. say what I do or what a library assistant in Swift Current does and that sort of thing. So, and we do have a benefit package. Oh, okay. And, and, and yeah. you combined two jobs then. So you've combined the children's programming and then, you know, and you make an income there. And then you've combined yeah. your passion for the arts and, yeah. and writing and making a job there, you yeah. know, or making income there. And, and other yeah. people that we've had present have said the same thing. They do a variety of things that creates their overall dream kind of job. And the income yeah. is all combined. So. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and that is just what I do. And because I have a passion for both too. So for example, mm. this morning, I was teaching plasticine classes to Prairie South uh, School Division children. And then we're going to do some feeding classes. So it's really sharing knowledge there. Okay, yeah. so specific challenges with the library sometimes come with um, dealing with patrons uh, one of those things is it's learning to give customer service. And I think that's anywhere. And some people are just, you know, they're, they're having a bad day. So sometimes they might be shouting at you or frustrated that you don't have this book or that sort of thing. Um, and of course, lots of people do have mental health issues. And so you may be dealing with someone who has a mental health issue and that sort of thing. So you kind of have to have skills in that area to be able to deal with that and we do provide our staff with a lot of education in that way so that we know how to cope with and to handle um, patrons and then often we are quite busy and so sometimes it's like oh I forgot to take a 15 minute break and sit down and now it's the end of the day so <laughs> that can be like always on the go like you you do work quite a bit whether it's mental where you're thinking about how to think uh create a grant or whether you're actually physically running back and forth, um, serving patrons, getting books, all those sorts of things, assisting uh, families with finding books to help their kids to read and all that sort of thing. So it can be. What are demanded. the hours of work? Um, if you're full time, you work 7.5 hours in a day, which is 37.5 hours in a week. If you are part time, uh, we have anywhere from three hours a day up to, I think, 15. And depending on where our part-time staff is, sometimes they will have 21 hours, but they're not, not quite full-time. Mm -hmm. And then okay. those hours of operation are usually a half hour before the library opens and then closes, which is how it's timed. Okay. Well, I have one last question to you and uh, for you. It's kind of... Uh, a couple of questions in one and it's about being an author and a publisher uh sure. you know how do people get started in that did you know that you wanted to be a writer all the time and i um, did yeah. know i <laughs> wanted to be a writer <laughs> from when i was really young um i really wanted to be published by a traditional publisher first so that's uh places like scholastic books and that sort of thing but uh, it didn't matter how I wrote my piece, I sent it back. I always got rejections, which is very frustrating until uh, I uh, got published in Real Canadian Kids Magazine. And I was like, yay, finally. And then I did um, publish through Balboa Press because it was more of a spiritual type book. And so one of the things with publishers, if you want traditional publishing is you really have to read their criteria and know the market that they're meeting because that's part of the reason why they reject authors is because your work doesn't fit their criteria or their stuff. It doesn't mean that it's bad work, it just doesn't fit. So mm -hmm. if you want to self-publish, which we did a lot with the Prairie Quills, and that's kind of where I've gotten my, my training self, uh, 
training through self-publishing. And what we did was we had found a local print shop. So at the time it was Copies Express. Um, I believe Signs Here does some of it in town. Or there's other print places that will do it. I'm exploring, um, what is that one now? Ah, I know there's Amazon and then there is the another one that's really famous for doing self-published books. And they put it out very well. For some reason, it's slipping my brain as to what it's called. Um, Ingram, Ingram? No, nope, that's chapters. It'll come back to me when I remember. <laughs> but basically, you can do a print book and an ebook, and you just have to work with kind of like a template. And so that's how I want to publish my Diary of a Candy Cane Skeleton book. Once I've done my last six pictures that I need for the uh, juvenile novel. And so with the, kind of like the juvenile novel or a middle grade, they have, they still have some pictures, whether it's two pictures per chapter or three pictures per chapter. Um, publishing picture books can be more costly because of the color. And you always want to think about um, how many pages in your book. And normally, like traditional picture books are done in eight. So it's like um, they print them in a sheet of kind of four back to back. And so they say eight pages. And so you would do kind of like eight or 16 or uh, 24 or 32 uh, pages. And uh, you try to keep the language of a picture book more simplistic and no more than a thousand words or less because it makes it difficult to read if it's more than that especially to young children and so sometimes if students, are, if students are interested in becoming a writer or publishing something how do they get started in that um you can definitely just start writing ideas or you can take workshops like i have done and learn how to write the books. So, and like I said, the Institute of Children's Literature is a really good program. And they start you out with writing um, magazine stories and they make you keep your word length between like a thousand words or under. And I find it hard to write 500 words sometimes. Um, and then they, like there's novel writing courses that you can do all that sort of thing. Um, and there is also, different online courses that you can research. Like I just finished a copy editing course through the uh, college down in Weyburn. And so learning about copy editing and that sort of thing. And I want to do, um, some people call it a substantial editing course. Um, I've heard of it as developmental editing. So that's like developing character plot setting. And so I'm waiting to be able to take that one. That one is a little bit more pricey and it's only through a university in the States because I want to be able to understand the structure better on how to develop. Like I can write and it comes to me naturally because I've done it since I was 14. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's polished. And so some things aren't polished. And there are a lot of good how to write books out there. And there's lots of ebooks. Um, I always recommend joining a writing group because, uh, especially like Prairie Quills, you have a broad spectrum of different writers. You've got your beginner, your emerging, and your professional, and you can get a lot of good advice from professional writers. Um, some of the other things that I did, like Brenda Niskala, as I had introduced, um, she was part of the Sage Hill teen writing course back in the 90s when I was a teenager. And that was how I met her. And so taking courses through Sage Hill, if you're um, a teenager, I believe Swift Current is going to be having one this summer. Um, and it's online. And so you can go to Sage Hill and sign up and, and uh, get in on that action. And then you work with a professional author who's published and can teach you some uh, skills with writing. And then for publishing, like I said, you can explore self-publishing through different ways and medias. Um, I use Book Cover Pro to do my book cover designs. Um, some people prefer Adobe, but I don't understand Adobe well enough to be able to do a book cover. And I've seen YouTube videos on people that use Canva to do different types of book covers. And then you just kind of upload it and, and do that. 
So it's, it's interesting to see how something that you started learning about at 14, you're continuing to learn and learn and learn more to, to evolve your craft in, in writing and publishing and editing books. Yeah. So yeah. And there's never been done. like, I've signed up for uh, courses through um, Brian Henry and his uh, newsletter is called quick Brown Fox. And he has been a writing mentor for a long time. And he's even mentored Kelly Armstrong, who is like one of the famous fantasy authors. And uh, so sometimes he'll call her in for like a group chat and you get to be part of that and meet Kelly Armstrong. Or he'll call in some of the editors from the uh, children's publishing houses like Scholastics. He hosted Anne Sloan once. Um, I'd met one from Kids Can press and they'll have different little spotlights and then you send your work in and they'll give you feedback on on your work oh, neat. Neat. yeah neat. yeah and being part of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild helps too um, because you get different uh, updates on uh, developmental workshops and different things in different areas that you're in mm, good wow wow I don't loads know of info. <laughs> loads of info, lots of possibilities, how you can weave yeah. things in to create something that you're passionate about, that brings you joy, that I heard you say, you know what, I'm going to do this till I retire, but I don't know when that will be. So that's exciting. Yeah. So on behalf of the Regina Industry Education Council and Chinook School Division, I'd like to thank you for your presentation with us today. Uh, your enthusiasm for the work that you do is infectious. Um, I, I'm pleased that you were able to share personal highlights of the work that you do and still make it real that it's something that's ongoing. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.